torn myself away from repotting cactus while listening to some awesome death metal to bring you this review of Williams Pride Apple. This apple is a triumph of modern apple breeding. This is what we want to see turned out of modern breeding projects. It is not a commercial success. And that is the reason that we don't see more apples like this being churned out of breeding projects because the orientation is so heavily skewed from the planning of the tr of the breeding all the way through to you know the release it's just about fitting in to this modern food paradigm of like this modern industrial distribution oriented mass scale paradigm while there's still a lot of leeway within that to improve apples and they are improving and we're going to get more and more flavorful apples in that paradigm it still is a limited framework with which in within which to work that's just the reality but this one squeaked through it's not a commercial success but you have never tasted an apple as good as these are this year off my trees out of a store probably very unlikely if you're just in grocery stores no specialty markets you know maybe you know farmers markets that's a different thing but very unlikely forget all the like crispest apple this apple is not the crispest that must be the most annoying fly walking the face of the planet right now it's not the juiciest it's not yeah you're not going to bite into it and have it go crisp and then crisp 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 crunch crunch while you eat it uh juice is not going to squirt out the sides of your mouth it's got a dry tannic thing to it because these are essentially dry farmed i think i watered this tree once or twice really early in the season because we're in like this really heavy drought and i just wanted to get them caught up as if it was like a normal year and we'd had enough rain to get the ground saturated other than that they're mostly dry farms so they're very sweet very flavorful but they have like a tannic dryness to the to the skin and that's not like something people seek out or are used to in like modern apples but the flavor is delicious it's like a spicy apple candy very sweet uh very rich just delicious like no one's gonna bite into this and and not love it you know and, and not just forget all that crap you know for, forget all that conditioning crap about like this is the crispest apple i've i've eaten like three honey crisp now i keep buying them in the store just hoping to see what the fuss is about and i'm sure they're better grown off a tree or whatever and i like crispy eat, light eating apples but in no way is it exceptional uh, as far as I've seen. I don't, I don't get it. It's exceptionally crisp after you pick it, drag it through storage, torture it, and almost kill it to death, and then get it onto your into your fruit bowl, you know. So let's talk about this variety in terms of uh, culture, like growing it actually, and why you should grow it, and who should grow it, which is everybody. And then we'll set up a better camera and taste this. All right, so here we are at my early Franken tree. This is a chestnut crab, which is really not ripe yet. Like if I shook this now, I might get a, a specimen or two that would fall off that's like early ripening. But the Williams Pride have been falling off for a while. I also have a Sunrise, which is this limb, but that's actually more of a September apple. Uh, Carrie Pippin is already gone. I didn't even bag those because they're not that exciting. St. Edmund's Pippin or St. Edmund's Russet, sometimes called. Um, not quite ripe yet either and then the whole top of the tree is Williams Pride. So most mornings when I come out here there's one or two apples lying on the ground. So the first thing to talk about then is this apple has a long season and that is awesome. Okay um, I don't think commercial I'm not a commercial orchardist but I don't think they actually like that you know for them it's like they get the pickers out into the field in a certain block of trees why would you want to come back four or five times? You know, it's just expensive to pick small amounts of apples, get them to the distributor, et cetera, et cetera. This apple has a long season, which is great for home growers because you get to eat delicious fresh dessert apples for like three weeks. So aside from the ones that fall on the ground at any given time, I can come out here, 
shake the tree. If it, nothing comes out, I just shake it a little harder. That was a, quite a bit harder. And a bunch of them fall out, and these are ripe. One of these that's in a dark paper bag so we can see the difference. Yeah, that's just, that looks amazing. That looks perfect. So you'll see that this is a beautiful apple too. It's got this really dark red skin. This would be darker even over here if it wasn't in this bag, but these bags do allow them to cover, uh, color it pretty good. This is what happens when you exclude the light completely. Look at that. If I took this bag off, this would turn red, that red within like a week or so. It would also get eaten by birds, and that's why all of these apples are bagged, because birds love this variety. Once they find them, and they're this like big, bright red, easy to eat apple, it has a long season, so like even the early apples are pretty edible, they will just destroy them and you won't get any at all. So that's a drawback to this variety. Birds know what's good and what's not, and this is good. Remember this specimen right here, you know, that's a big, handsome, like grocery store sized apple, maybe a little small, but again, it's dry farmed. And, uh, you know, they'll vary from a little smaller than this up to bigger than that. I can't recall ever seeing a speck of scab on this variety. If I have, it just, you know, it's not enough to matter. And it's allegedly, as I recall, resistant to fire blight too. But my one of my trees I've seen suffer really bad from what looks like blossom blight, which I don't know if that's actually the same organism as fire blight. Like we're, we're just not used to dealing with that here and it just cropped up um, not very long ago. So that's kind of a new thing for me. But one year, a lot of trees got this kind of blossom blight, like the blossoms died, then the leaves on the the spurs shriveled and the fruit, if there was any, turned black. And it was just really awful. But William's Pride was actually one of the worst ones. And I kind of freaked out because I was like, you know, reading about it. And I was like, oh my God, I need to cut these trees down and they're gonna infect everything else, right? So I ended up cutting it down and it's been growing back ever since. So I don't know what to think about that in terms of like the fire blight resistance. It might be that it, you know, will get it, but survive, you know, in the in the long run. So I, maybe someone can shed some light on that who's used to growing this variety or used to dealing with uh, fire blight and blossom blight. Culturally, otherwise, it's a vigorous tree. Like it, this is just the top of the tree is William's Pride. And I'm always cutting it back because it does tend to grow quite a lot. Um, it seems to be productive. Um, really, in, all in all, with culture, I have no complaints. Produces quite a bit. Uh, just watch out for the birds. So as far as growing it, it seems to be a great grower. I have no complaints, nothing I've noticed that's a problem or anything like that. Always get these beautiful, clean apples. And, you know, maybe my scab uh, pressure is not so high as uh, some other warm, humid places, but try it out and see. The only other thing I can think of culturally is I've always thought this was one of those really hardy apples from the University of Minnesota. But now that I'm thinking about it, I'm not so sure. So you're going to have to do your own research on cold hardiness. I think, though, that it's, it is a cold hardy variety. So let's grab a different camera and taste these apples. You think I could do that through the whole video? It's a little distracting, huh? Williams Pride. This specimen was chilled in the fridge. I think this was actually an early specimen that I didn't think was ripe yet and put in the fridge. So it may have been ripening in the fridge. One thing I've noticed about apples that ripen over a long season, and I think this may be especially true of summer apples, the latest ripening ones will tend to have a lot more flavor or more complex flavor. The earliest specimens of this tasted like concentrated cider, I would say. As the season creeps on, the character is more like this intense apple candy, but spicy, like a spicy apple candy. This year, like the best ones, are reminding me of Sweet 16, which is like the craziest, most in-your-face, uh, you know, spicy cherry candy flavor apple. So just the, the fact that it invokes that is, is saying a lot, especially for a summer apple. So you'll frequently hear people say things like, yeah, it's really great for a summer apple, right? It needs a qualification. It's like in this season, for its season, this is a good apple at any season. 
at its best. It is complex, very rich, flavorful, and just, it works. Like the whole package just works. So let's see how this one is, and if it's not up to par, we'll just go grab another one. It's a little overripe. Mm. It's super good. It's still super good, but it's definitely heading in the direction of a more monotone red apple flavor. Just really, really classic red apple flavor. It's still, at this point, it's still all the best characteristics of that, but some of the complex spiciness or something, it's getting overwhelmed by that just apple-y red apple flavor. This, like right now, would just be an amazing Waldorf salad apple. And, and just in general, like I don't think You'd be hard pressed to find a better apple for making Waldorf salad. In fact, I'm just like thinking, do I have any walnuts so I can go make it after this? So I'm going to go get a different specimen though, because I want one that's like more current. Actually, didn't we just knock one off? So here's three that we just knocked off. And I was saying that they, they're pretty variable in size and, and stuff. Well, look at, look at these, like they're everything from flattened, and, and lumpy to, you know, more oval and lumpy to this like bizarre cone shaped one here. So yeah, highly variable in that regard. You know, I, I would much prefer that this was chilled. It, it's better chilled. I, I think it's, it's just a different eating experience and this is actually a little warm from the sun, not ideal. I did want to say though that while that one's starting to go over the hill and it's been in the fridge a while, for an early apple, this is actually very durable and holds well in the fridge. And there, it's not one of these apples, it's just the classic summer apple that's ready and then it's gone, you know. It's, it's not long lived, it's not super durable, but it's more durable than most summer apples. Wow. Mm. Yeah, so much flavor and sugar. That one also is probably on the descending edge of ripe. I want to try this one because it looks a little, you can see there's some green there. That's probably not so much an indicator of unripeness. It could just be that this part was just really heavily shaded. Even in the white bag, you know, if this was pressed against a leaf really close or against a branch, it would uh, not color up. Yeah, so this one's a little more sprightly. Um, there, more of the acidity is still present. Um, it's actually almost a, a tiny bit starchy even. So this one, this one's kind of on the leading up edge, you know, I mean, this is what happens when you become super picky about this stuff and you, you, you do it all the time and, and you get into like all the nuance of it. So they all have the same basic character though, which this year, this year is definitely red apple. It's like a caricature of red apple flavor almost. It's, it's almost exaggerated, like, like I said, it's like red apple candy, but with more nuance, like there's a spicy quality that's just kind of like around the top when you first bite into it, that's just really gives it much more dimensionality. In other years, I've had it taste more complex, more flavors that border on like berries, maybe something else going on that's really is different than this just cider flavor. But I would say the most typical thing I think of this apple in season when it's ripe here is a concentrated cider or red apple candy type of a flavor. If that's not your cup of tea, you may not like it, but I mean, it's, it, this, it's not my favorite kind of apple. The apples like that, that have a perfumey quality um, the, and the most classic one is uh, Red Delicious. I just don't like, like the best Red Delicious, like go back to the roots of Red Delicious before all the Super Red Sports and you know, the, just the Hawkeye, like, cause that's what I, we had when I was a kid in the stores is we had red apples that were striped green and yellow. You know, it was like the old Hawkeye more. By the time Red Delicious industry just collapsed, they were all just brick, just brick red and terrible. But even at its best, I don't like those apples. I don't like that perfumey, floral, classic red, you know, American red apple flavor. This has the red apple flavor without any of that crap, but instead it has like a spicy quality. So yeah, if, if you don't like that typical kind of red apple flavor, 
I'm going to guess that you'll still enjoy this, especially in season, you know, because you still do have to qualify that is that this, and that's the point of, of saying that it's good in any season, is that you don't have to qualify this as a, as a good as a summer apple, but the truth is it is, and it stands out, you know, and, and the two standouts so far, and I, I said this like a gajillion times in videos, are Chestnut Crab and Williams Pride. In August, this is obviously leading a little bit because the chestnut crabs aren't ready yet. Those are the two to start with. Like, like if you're not going to get any other summer apples, start with those two. The third I would add for cooking is Carrie Pippin. It's a, it, you would think it was a good eating apple in the summer, and, and there are people that are big fans of it for that. But here, when you compare it to Williams Pride and chestnut crab, it just it just doesn't stack up quite but it's a really good cooking apple in that season because it's a little bit more on the acidic uh refreshing acidic side so it's a good apple to have and you know but start with williams fried chestnut crab carry pippin and we'll see from there i'm i'm tasting a couple of uh, seedlings this year one is a descendant of this uh williams fried is a seed parent nicknamed twang and it's not quite ready yet. So it's appearing that that's gonna be more along with chestnut crab in uh, the ripening sequence. I think anyone who wants to have a, a broad season apple collection should have this. And don't think you need to plant a tree. Like, don't, like it's time, the new paradigm I'm try, I've been trying to introduce since I got on here is away from this idea that you need an orchard full of trees to get variety. With apples, it almost doesn't matter what tree you plant. I mean, it matters a little bit. Some don't make as good a rootstock, but essentially if you got, you know, a pink lady from the, the nursery and you planted it, well, start adding stuff. It's easy. I have like a 11 part, I think now, series on grafting that'll show you how to do it. Yeah, there's no reason not to have this, like a really long, uh, you know, season of apples. I showed you that tree right there where we picked this apple. I only have five main varieties on that, which is like each main branch, there's four of those and the top, so that's five. But now I'm starting to add a lot more stuff onto it. And there's like right now, I can easily fit 30 to 40 varieties on that tree. Don't uh, limit your thinking regarding that. Uh, the best apple to plant is just any apple almost it's almost that simple you know maybe you could look into rootstocks for disease resistance you want a, a base variety that's got enough vigor to drive growth and all that but that's all kind of secondary like it, it almost doesn't matter what you plant or what you've planted get some scions get a sharp knife grab some plastic bags i have videos on using household materials for grafting you know i could walk into almost anyone's house grab enough stuff, if I have to sharpen a, a kitchen knife on a brick outside and make grafts without bringing anything with me. So it, it ain't rocket science and it doesn't require like accessorizing with a bunch of crap. You know, don't, don't go on Amazon and go, I'm gonna learn to graft and like accessorize and spend like, you know, a hundred bucks on crap that you don't need. Like especially those stupid grafting tools, don't, don't get one of those. That's what I get for not planning ahead. I forgot to talk about this apple in apple breeding. I hear from people sometimes who are like, hey, Stephen, I just wanted to write and tell you that I have my own little apple breeding project that I'm starting in my backyard or something. Like some of these people have never grown really anything. Like they don't care about, they're not plant people. They don't care about plants. You know, this isn't something that like a longstanding interest or anything like that. I've been able to communicate like how excited I am about the possibilities, you know, in apple breeding. And it's just a, such a fun project to follow. And like, just something clicks with certain people where they, you know, you realize the potential and you realize that around the corner and the next corner and the next corner is something great for sure. And something new, like that's the promise of growing apples from seed. It's there but it's like a treasure hunt. Are we gonna find it? And the journey, you know, the search, the drive, the compulsion is just like a treasure hunt. You know, it's, exact, it's the same exact psychology. There's gold in them, their seeds. One of the funnest things about this pursuit is the planning. 
you know, and I would put it like the inspired crosses, right? The, the inspired crosses, the ones where you eat something and you see it grow and you, you take in its qualities and you're just like, okay, this, this could go somewhere. Like these genetics can go somewhere. And that, I think that can really be said for this apple. I mean, it's got this amazing scab resistance. It's early, which is pretty cool. Some people don't want to eat apples in the summer. I'm all over it. I love apples. Like if I can get a good apple at any season, I'm going to, I'm going to eat it. Like, yeah, I'm eating mangoes and you know, if I had them, I'd be eating peaches and probably a lot of them and I'd be eating fewer apples. But if I can have them again, you don't have to have a whole tree, right? So I could have a tree with 30 and 40 varieties and have this much Williams pride just to fill in when I feel like eating a freaking great apple in August, which is frequently it turns out, you know, this is in that category. It's, it's an inspiring apple. It's got so much going for it and then you you know you you taste something else maybe it's early maybe it's not right that like maybe uh, like think of sweet 16 and they probably have some parents in common because they're they're just seeming like a lot of similarities and i think they're out of the same breeding program again can't remember it reminds in in some ways of sweet 16 but sweet 16 is more in your face like more flavor more complexity more spice cherry flavor what if we could get a sweet 16 like apple by crossing these two apples that ripens in August? Who, we have to go, we have to go after that. I mean, this is the, this is the ruin. This will be the ruin of us is <laughs> just that there's, there's constantly these new places to go, right? This gene pool is just incredibly diverse. Just if you take just the flavor alone, Add on top of that season. Just take those two factors, flavor and season. Just the, this just like seems like endless possibilities. I had an, one of the apples off there was like an early ripening St. Edmund's Pippin, like very classic russet looking. It tasted like coconut. Like I, the skin was just a dead ringer for coconut. I mean, I've never taste. I don't recall ever tasting that before in an apple. It's just there's endless possibilities. So you know the other thing about this apple for breeding is that it does show red flesh. And these latest specimens, I'm just getting a little hint of it, but I've seen pictures of, uh, I know Eliza Greenman posted a picture on Instagram or something of a Williams Pride that had like a lot of pink flesh, you know, like really considerable. And I've seen, I can cut in a picture here of ones from here that have showed considerable pigmentation in the flesh. One would think, you know, I haven't really proven this out yet, but one would think if you take two apples with red flesh, even if they just have a hint of red flesh, you would think that there would be some kind of synergy in the genetics there that would encourage more red flesh and redder flesh apples. So that's important, not just because it's fun to bite into an apple and see pink flesh, but also because the pigment itself and the genetics that go with it seem to carry other flavors, red flavors. So think berries, cherries, strawberries, you know, raspberries, generic berries, uh, mixed fruit punch. And while this apple here, as I grow it here, th those aren't the predominant flavors, they do occur once in a while. And one would think we could encourage that red flesh and encourage those flavors and start to bring them forward. It, if, if we're just breeding for us, right? We're not breeding for the market. We're not worrying about the next crispy crisp apple, like, you know, Williams crisp, uh, red, pink, pink crisp, whatever the next thing, crispy thing that everyone's just chasing relentlessly is. But just look at mostly flavor and, and because modern apple breeding has put in a lot of great work toward disease resistance, we get to have this to work with. And we get to start with this. It's got everything going for it. This apple is awesome. So yes, add this to your breeding stable, you know, ASAP. You know, try, try to make them inspired cross. I always encourage people to, to really 
go in that direction. You know, don't just plant anything. If you have to wait a year or two, uh, get some pollen from me and pollinate, you know, your Williams Pride with something that I can provide you with, like cherry cox pollen. Another one I'm real excited about, I've made a bunch of crosses, is pink parfait, right? So here's an apple with outstanding crisp texture, if, if that's what you like. Uh, light pink flesh, but with some strawberry flavor. And oddly, it ripens in January. December, January, February. I've had it in everywhere from December to like February in perfect condition off the tree. Honey flavor, just all around outstanding apple. Terrible scab, right? So now we're mixing a red fleshed apple with outstanding everything, is, everything about it except for the scab that I can think of is awesome. Unless you don't want apples in February because it's too cold and they'll freeze or whatever but it gets terrible scab. So we've mixed these two things. Hopefully, we'll, hopefully, you know, this is just, uh, my approach to apple breeding is dumb and on purpose. I don't overthink it. I just go by the, the most, I want to stick to the most simplistic type of logic, which is like make red flesh apple go together, make more red, you know? I mean, literally that's, that's the level I'm working at. I don't research plant breeding. Genetics bore the crap out of me. I have no interest in Mendelian genetics none of that crap. So one would think though, mixing two light pink fleshed apples, one with great scab resistance, both with everything else great about them. Yeah, that's an, that's what I'm talking about. That's an inspired cross, you know, because I know there's, there's more, much more potential lurking in both of those apples genes. And, and, uh, something good has to come out of that eventually and it could be it, it could be that the, the genes meet in the middle and make a mid-season apple that's great it could be that uh it follows after either parent and and makes a super late hanging apple or a super early apple but by making that initial cross we've injected that scab resistance potential into an otherwise already amazing apple why, why wouldn't we do that this that's a no-brainer cross to me and i have a lot more i could talk about like now i'm starting to cross this and onto like cherub uh, you know my mid-season uh, mid mid to latish season red fleshed crab apple with wixen genetics i mean so many fun things to cross i, I have used this a lot i'm continue to use it in the future as a gene donor and the breeding project and uh yeah, I just wanted to fill that in. Start planning your pollinations. I'll have a lot of open pollinated seed of this, mostly in an early seed, uh, early apple seed blend, and I should have uh, pollen hopefully in uh, spring. Okay, death metal.